Okay, very good morning. Anthony here from the desk at Amplify in London. It's Thursday 30th of May. Hope you are well. Uh, going to cover a couple of different things. Uh, update on the trade war. Uh, nothing specific, I would say. Uh, direct from China or the US, but some interesting articles in circulation like this one on Bloomberg uh, in reference to Europe. And so we'll have a look at that. Uh, also going to have a look at the uh, Conservative Party kind of leadership race. Where does that reside at the moment? Uh, and also importantly, is it ha or not having any impact on the pound at the moment, which we can discuss. Also going to have a look at some comments that came out of the head of Morgan Stanley and also one of the world's biggest hedge funds, Ray Dalio. Uh, and then also uh, API crude oil infantries. I can update you on as well as some interesting comments coming out of Iran last night, which have uh, captured some attention as well. So that's what's on the agenda. Let me just flick over and give you a, a flavor of the general setup cross asset of how things are uh, residing at the moment and it's a, a relatively uh, muted open it's pretty flat overall currency pairs uh, reflection of the fact that Dixie is, is basically unchanged uh, as I'm going to explain there's a lot of news about uh, this Tory leadership race but ultimately none of it at this point moving markets and quite rightly so uh, but definitely need to keep on top of uh, the news flow as it comes. Uh, equity wise, uh, after what was quite a negative day yesterday, obviously just given the elevation in rhetoric coming out of China, we've had a bit of a natural pullback of sorts, albeit if you look at you know, the kind of sessions uh, over the last couple of days, we're still down, but a little bit of a, a moderate recovery of sorts. Uh, that kind of seen overnight in Asia pack and feeding through to the open this morning. So index futures a touch higher, uh, both in Europe and the US. Uh, oil, you can see down at the bottom, also seeing predominantly a, a, a sizable move that came uh, late yesterday evening, uh, just around the kind of six, seven o'clock time. But also, as we'll see, oil inventories as well, just helping keep prices elevated. But we'll have a look at that six o'clock move in a second. Uh, and as a consequence, then, given the decent rally we'd seen in fixed income futures throughout yesterday's session, given the, the relative risk off tone, now that the kind of dust has settled, uh, both bunds and treasuries have pulled back uh, a decent amount. So the US 10 year down about eight ticks this morning. But I'd say more of a function of uh, just uh, profit taking on the longs from yesterday more than anything else. All right. Well, look, let's jump straight into the news. And, uh, and as per usual, Sam will come on afterwards uh, and talk about the charts. But yeah, this is one of the, the things that Bloomberg are running as their, their main kind of headline story. Talking about US-EU trade talks a stumble or a stumbling, threatening new trade war front. Now, again, it's quite interesting given the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the trade war, if you like, has been so focused on that of the US and China. Uh, and so one of the things is, well, why is that? Why has Trump pretty much neglected Europe as a whole? Uh, we know that he's delayed the auto tariffs, which were going to have a very meaningful impact because the, Europe's largest economy, Germany, is highly dependent on the exports of vehicles, particularly to the US market. But why has Trump been so kind of uh, relaxed about this issue? And one of the main things is I was having a look at, um, yeah, this is a, a fantastic website for any of those who have not come across it before. Um, my colleague Saif Ali um, came, came to me with this and it's a fantastic research, research tool or to develop your knowledge uh, and it's called uh, the Economic Observatory essentially and, and you can punch in different countries names and it gives you a kind of a top level but an ability to go to a granular level of what exactly are you know, when you talk about trade from one country to another, what exactly is it that they're trading? And so what type of volume? And you can get it all the way down to kind of different layers to specific products. But one of the things here is, well, who and what countries does the US import from? Now, to give it some context, this will help explain why the, the, the kind of negotiation is so geared towards China, because the top import origin uh, into the from the US point of view is China to the tune of around 476 billion dollars whereas if you look who's second what country does the US import from uh, in second place it's then Mexico at 307 billion dollars it's then Canada 
at 274 billion dollars it's then Japan at 125 billion dollars so hence the reason why he's been in Japan this week he's obviously had pretty close ties anyway with Shinzo Abe the Prime Minister of Japan but not only is Japan important from an import point of view from the US but obviously politically as well just given the tensions at the moment in the East China Sea and geographically where it's situated with North Korea uh, and also with China so that kind of makes sense as well but you know clocking in at fifth place even though Germany is one of the largest economies in the world from an import point of view it only ranks fifth at 111 billion dollars again this is in comparison to nearly half a trillion when you're talking about China so in terms of the you know the the importance of these relationships if you look at it by numbers it's way more important with China with Mexico with Japan than it is with countries like like Germany for example which might go some way to explain why they've kind of uh, it's, it's not really been a dialogue that's been happening now what this article is basically suggesting is a couple of things one is that basically then given all the things I've described the talks between the US and Europe have not moved at all and apparently some trade negotiators from the US were speaking to their counterparties in Brussels recently and to flex their muscles they basically whipped out a binder of 150 pages worth of negotiated um, legal documents that they've done with China trying to kind of bully Europe into saying well look you know we've not even begun yet so you better start making some concessions to get the ball rolling and so the secondary factor that's going to make this potentially quite complicated is that as we saw from the recent European elections we've got a pretty fragmented European landscape politically now the uh, kind of the the, the bad performance of the traditional kind of established parties and the rise of say the liberals but also that of a more populist movement has meant that actually negotiations now between the European whole and the US is probably going to be even more complicated so yeah although this isn't really moving markets right now definitely this is somewhat another worrying macro factor to consider and certainly one that must be addressed by Donald Trump obviously he's got a he's got a definitive timeline where he needs to start running for re-election for a second term that we know at the end of 2020 so he does have to do something with Europe at some point but obviously he's got bigger fish to fry uh, in the form of China at the moment so I thought I'd mention that I thought it was quite interesting to have to look at that website that I mentioned uh, is pretty good because look if you go down to here you can see all of the types of exports that the US does and if you're looking at imports quite an interesting thing here is now what is the main import that the US has um, US is the largest importer in the world uh, and the main product to which they import is cars so even though if you actually bump this up to exports exports comprise of um, four and a half percent of the 1.25 trillion um, per year of goods that the US export. Well, you, know, you have you know, General Motors, Ford Motor, and so on, but German, Japanese automakers, they really dominate the global scene when it comes to manufacturing of cars, and the US imports the most at 8.3 percent. So you can see here why countries like Germany economically have been suffering so much because not only they have kind of a, a trifecta of issues domestically um, kind of the political developments that have been happening the loss of power from the CDU CSU Merkel era fading and the rise of kind of nationalism and populism has been impacting the government's power uh, you've then got the uncertainties around Brexit of course and the, the neighboring relationships with Britain and then you've got this situation where you know the largest sector uh, contributor if you like from a from a composition of their index point of view is the automakers which are which are the biggest and so the ability to export is pivotal for a country like Germany which is why they have recently flirted with this technical recession and why you know we've made in heavy contraction when it comes to manufacturing so 
yeah, a little bit of background, I guess, from uh, uh, kind of how things reside, and uh, definitely is going to be interesting. Uh, this is looking at the share of U.S. imports of car and car parts, and again, it really kind of uh, ratifies the point that I'm making. Mexico number one, Japan, Canada, then Germany comes in. Uh, and obviously from an import point of view, there's lots of other things. It's not predominantly car parts and vehicles that China are producing. It's all different types of things. But definitely from these other countries, it's key. One thing uh, also, uh, just to make this, you know, these briefings are not only supposed to be an update on markets. They are supposed to be educational as well. Uh, and one thing I did want to make you aware of is that Reuters do these excellent um, what they call an explainer series of articles. Now, typically they'll produce these maybe two a day, I would say, and they can be on any subject. Um, and for instance, the one that they've published overnight is about rare earth supplies. Now, I did discuss this at length, so I won't go into all the details about rare earths or what it means for trade negotiations. But the point being is, before about two days ago, I knew close to nothing about rare earths. But just by spending, I would say, an hour reading a few different articles, but these explainer series articles can save you that hour into five minutes. From a trader's point of view, you can get absolutely in or up to speed with what exactly rare earths is, how it's used, where does it come from, where might this trade war then by default go to next, what could the next elevation be, you know, what could be an alternate country the US could import from, all of these factors which definitely for a short term intraday trader are pivotal if you're going to react to news to know. Now again it's just a great way of accumulation of knowledge over time uh, you know, doing the job that I do, um, you know, this is the way I would suggest for new people to learn. And what I mean by that is let the market be your guide and also be inquisitive. Now, you know, when this things like rare earths come up, it's an issue right now and it will likely not be an issue again after the trade war is settled in the months to come for another 10 years. But guess what? it will come back at some point and you're already a kind of semi expert in rare earths enough so that you can um, contextualize whether or not it's going to have a meaningful impact on the trading strategies that you're making so that's the point so again these explainer series on on Reuters they come out every day they cover a variety of different things um, not that you need to go away now and start reading all these things but just to be aware of you know the accumulation of knowledge takes time, but instead of trying to read everything, which is going to be an exhausting exercise, be more precise, target it in this way, and develop that knowledge, and you'd be surprised how quickly you start to learn a, uh, a little about a lot, which can make you highly effective in interpretation of news. All right, enough of that. Let's move on. Let's talk about this guy. Mr. Boris Johnson, so an update on the Brexit situation, and I must stress immediately, uh, the pound is not reacting to any of these news stories, but inherently, who does come in, depending on the severity of how hard they argue for Brexit or not, um, is going to have potentially a meaningful impact. So it's something we do need to monitor. Now, a couple of different things here. Boris Johnson, we heard the news yesterday, is to face a court hearing uh, basically alleging he repeatedly lied and misled the British public uh, as to the cost of EU membership. There's a particular reference to, you remember the famous scene of him stood in front of the bus and that he was going to save the UK sending 350 million a week to the EU and it was going to go to the NHS and obviously that was not, not the case. Um, but timing is obviously key. This is politics. There's a few people asking me about this yesterday. You know, is this a bit suspect with timing? Of course it is. This is how politics works. You're going to see a lot of mudslinging coming forward in the coming weeks. This is just regular activity that happens. If there's any skeletons, they're going to come out the closet because this is just how it works. Regardless of the fact they're all supposed to be 
you know, batting for the same team, that doesn't matter. This is politics, and these are people that are serving their own political gain and agenda more often than not than the putting the best interests of the country. That's just the way it is, the reality check. Um, so does this impact Boris's um, chances? Uh, I don't actually think it makes a great deal of difference, to be honest, but you know, Sam and I were talking about Boris and you know, he's such a divisive character. Can the grassroots conservative members really take that leap of faith and risk given that he was a, a decent London mayor but an absolute catastrophe as a foreign secretary upping the game and the ante into the prime ministerial role is that just a step too far will be yet to be seen an interesting thing that that's um, being calculated I know this is a bit small but um, this is a running checklist of the MPs of conservatives uh, so the 300 or so who form in Parliament and who they've thrown publicly their backing behind. And actually, from a, a Conservative MP point of view, even though this is actually to do with Conservative memberships who vote for this, uh, Michael Gove is actually the favourite. Um, only by a whisker, granted, but Michael Gove is number one, Dominic Rabb is number two, and then Boris Johnson is actually number three, followed by Jeremy Hunt who's taken a bit of an opposite side to Boris Johnson of late um, in regard to his stance about you know, the threat of no deal. Interestingly though, as you can see here, there's no mention at all of this lady. Uh, Andrea Leadsom, uh, kind of the, the nail in the coffin for Theresa May when she stepped down the day or two before the eventual resignation of Theresa May. Uh, but essentially what's happened here is she's being urged by colleagues to pull out of the race and basically throw her backing behind one of the candidates and for her to maximize her chance of becoming Britain's first female chancellor. So I would say that's probably going to be the case because you know logic would say there's no point running. I think she's only had two people back her publicly. You know, we've just seen the numbers for those other candidates, so she's not going to win. So by default, does she already start playing more of a strategic game to get a position of power uh, and therefore embed you know, in the, the likelihood of becoming chancellor? The other thing, of course, is, is this chap. Um, he is still alive, I'm told. He hasn't disappeared off the face of the planet. Um, but all jokes aside, Jeremy Corbyn, of course, um, is another pivotal player in this, this situation. And the big thing coming on the back of the you know, the devastating performance that the Conservative Party uh, had coming fifth in the European elections, the worst ever in the history of the party, Labour also suffered as well. In traditional um, you know, political times, what would normally happen is, you know, it's a mainstream party dominance and power swings from one to the other. But what the current context in the last three years has proved is that it's become a lot more fractured than that. And it's the the center ground that's becoming ever increasingly hard to manage and what's creating this kind of polarized situation of Brexit from the Brexit party to the green liberal democrat view of you know no Brexit at all so the the, the kind of pressure is on Corbyn um, Tom Watson the kind of you know one of the senior members has been quite vehement a backer trying to capture uh, this kind of centre and left ground by committing to a second referendum on the final deal. And so this is where this is heading. Uh, any new Brexit referendum should be about the terms of a deal struck with the EU and not a repeat of the leave and remain, according to Corbyn yesterday. Uh, and I do feel that this is probably one of the only opportunities that Labour has if they want to uh, maximise on this, is going down the route of a final deal uh, referendum at this point so definitely something to, to watch could he then start to capture some of that kind of uh, the vote that went to the Lib Dem which saw a decent increase uh, in that kind of litmus test of the um, what we had in the European elections can he capture that uh, as well as delivering on the mandate of, of Brexit in itself so yeah a couple of things there I won't go any further than that of where we currently reside uh, but I'll keep you updated as and when we get more uh, updates throughout the day.
just wanted to point out this. This was uh, Gorman, who's the head of Morgan Stanley, one of the major US banks, um, just talking in a Bloomberg interview about the general state of play in the global economy, the risk of trade war, uh, what's his thoughts. And basically he was going down the fact that actually he thinks that the Fed are going to stay on top of it and actually that stock collapse is unlikely and even if we went into a recession if what is being, indi or what is being indicated by the inversion of parts of the yield curve that we've seen uh, even yesterday the fact of the matter is that any recession would be short and shallow in his opinion um, Ray Dalio's also come out as well and, and kind of talked about the risks associated with this new uh, escalation that we've had with the targeting of technology firms in particular and the response with rare earths uh, in the last 24 hours about this game of brinksmanship and how that could have quite significant negative ramifications for markets if this brinksmanship goes a step too far and it and there's a miscalculation on negotiation and uh, how negative the implication could be on global markets so there's definitely a lot of you know, the kind of voices at a top level investor point of view uh, about the risks associated with this. Uh, and definitely, I think Donald Trump would be would be hearing these types of noises. But again, uh, it's up to him to kind of manage the situation. The reason why I pointed out this article was because for any new trader, I thought he made a really excellent comment. He said, quote, I would not encourage people to move one way or the other on stocks. There is too much uncertainty. There is nothing to be gained from trying to be clever at this point for a retail investor. I think that absolutely is, is right on the money. Um, now he's probably talking more about people investing generally in the stock market. But one thing that I have observed for some of the new traders is that definitely you know, the S&P yesterday was getting very close to quite a key technical point. Now, if I just quickly, Sam's going to talk about this a lot more. And you can see the market has responded, you know, very well to that key technical point of support around that ellipse on the right hand side of the chart. That being the 200 DMA, you got the, the kind of descending trend line that you had for the price activity over the last six months. Now, we broke through that quite violently, but importantly, from the daily close, we managed to, I think, just pretty much close at the level and we've rebounded since then. The point being is it can at these points, at these particular uh, kind of real key areas, become very tempting to trade, to trade the breakout, to get aggressive. And the point being is, is that yesterday was very choppy. And, and, and what I did see with some of the newer traders was getting a little bit caught up in the S&P kind of noise, if you like. And I think, you know, Gorman of Morgan Stanley makes a good point. You know, some of the better trades that I saw were the guys that were just sticking to the bread and butter, trading the currency pairs, which are making a little bit more sense at the moment. And this is all part of that objective kind of analysis that you do on a daily basis. You know, the conditions, where are we at the moment? And if you know, you're getting an uncommitted market, which I think is slightly the case at the moment with you know, the equity space where now we've hit that lower bound technical point. Do we get this kind of fluctuation of consolidation before the next meaningful move? It's you know, realizing that that is the case and then choosing the better trade at that point. So yeah, just a few thoughts. Finally, uh, before I hand you over to Sam, um, just looking at the chart, you can see we've had some pretty pretty wicked price action in oil of late. Um, I can see here we broke this. These are trend lines that I'm sure Sam had on yesterday. You can see when we broke that trend line, we popped lower, decent kind of 40 cent move, came back up, tested the trend line, came back down, target then on the yesterday pivots S2, which was the prior low on the 24th. So again, technically working quite well as the market broke down. But it's this recovery here that looks quite potent. Uh, and importantly, there were some comments that came out of Iran at around that time frame. Uh, and the Iranian supreme leader said, again, quote, Iran will not negotiate with the US. Iran will use military pressure if needed. And so it's not as if an escalation in the, the rhetoric from Iran is new. They've kind of already gone in that direction since the sanctions 
uh, all the waivers at least from the US uh, have been uh, have elapsed and now have not been renewed. They've already started to get more aggressive in their tone. But further comments like this certainly bring about the, the supply side uh, shock risk. That then coupled with this, which came out last night. These are the API crude oil infantry numbers. You had a drawdown of 5.265 million. Expectations on the street for a draw of 500,000. So much more bullish headline than anticipated. Cushing draw 176,000. Gasoline though was a build, 2.711 million. Distillates a draw of 2.144 million as well. And this obviously coming ahead of the, uh, the DOEs we'll get this afternoon. Uh, other than the DOEs, from a, a calendar point of view, it's very quiet this morning in Europe. It's a US dominated uh, session. You're going to get the second reading of first quarter GDP coming out of the States. Uh, that'll be your major 130 data. Uh, you've got core PCE, advanced goods trade balance, weekly jobless claims, pending um, home sales, as well as the infantries coming out uh, from the oil market later. Speaker wise, a couple things to be aware of. Bank of England's Ramsden is speaking shortly, a bit later on this morning. Uh, he's one of the MPC members. Um, you've then got Fed's Clarida voter speaking as well at 5pm this evening. All right, that is it from me. hope uh, there were some useful points there. I know not a lot of it is kind of market relevant. Overall, really, it's pretty quiet fundamentally. I'd say the market movement this morning is more a reversal as the dust settles from some of the negativity from yesterday. A bit of a natural retracement, so equities higher, bonds pulling back um, as we kind of push on. Oil a little bit elevated for those reasons we just discussed. All right, hand you over to Sam. I wish you a good day ahead. See you in the chat room. <coughs> yeah, hi guys, good day. Uh Good morning. As Ant mentioned there, you're just getting a, a bit of reversal of the, of the moves from yesterday or recent times, to be fair. Teenage just pushing to that low around uh, the S1. I'll just bring the S&P in uh, to begin with as well, as that's pushing up and coming up to what was such a, a key level yesterday. And likelihood is it's going to be a key level this morning uh, and today. So you can see what was the uh, original low from yesterday uh, during the Asian session. 27.92 and a quarter. We, we had you see a couple of tests there and just failing to break through that uh, led to that down move there and the 200-day the moving average coming in to, to support price to, to the downside and we have then pushed up and obviously that longer term trend line. Uh, just be keeping an eye uh, on 27.92. I don't think I would be wanting to you know, even if it was come down to the pivot, really be looking to to buy unless we got above that area. Pretty key, uh, along with 2800 to the upside. Uh, if you are looking for that continuation, you can see we're half following a, a bit of a trend, and this might be something to look at in the afternoon. I think some of the issue can be trading the S and P in the morning when it's just waiting really for its its bigger move uh, in in the afternoon. Uh, but stocks, uh, if we just put this onto well, we can go to a monthly chart. You can see, well, the, the NASDAQ, you know, big down month, the S&P the same, and, and the Dow Jones, of course, uh, likewise as well. And actually the Dow Jones, certainly on a, on a weekly chart, you can see has is, is come under quite a lot of pressure. One, two, three, four, five, six weeks where we haven't really had a, a further push. Uh, so I wouldn't be too surprised to see some of these markets just have a bit of a reversal. 25,000 of the Dow Jones is obviously a key area to keep an eye on the futures. Uh, just having a look here on the weekly chart, the Nasdaq has got quite a lot of support around this this point. You can you can call it the previous all-time high as well that we had at the beginning of 2018. That previous high from that was the support level yesterday. So a slight uh, recovery in markets. And I think just looking at the, the Nasdaq, and again, this might be something just to focus on later can we get back above what was the low the 27th of march and also the 23rd of may and then you might start to see a bit of a reversal in things of course it'll be interesting to see where we close the days uh, for those markets um, having a look into the currencies uh, the pound yesterday did start to drift lower into the back end of the session uh, the, the high of the day uh, worked as a pretty good resistance uh, and we did drift lower not 
to exactly test the low that we had back on the 23rd but I would just be keeping an eye on that area and also from the low of yesterday you can see we're actually just coming under a touch of pressure now as things start to to pick up it'll be interesting to see what happens literally where we're trading now 126 36 whether this could be a potential trend line and if that was to break through well you can see 126 between the s1 and s2 which is that really key level on the the longer term i'll just bring that in to picture uh well you wouldn't put it past it to eventually get tested coming from that 19th of june low there for the pound so that's something i would would have marked up uh and keeping an eye on uh for the pound as we just pushing lower the euro uh, as well under a bit of pressure as the dollar strengthens this morning continuation really of the, the recent trend for euro any recovery it has and of course this was last thursday so last week where we touched that multi-year low to really push higher it's just given people another opportunity to get short for this market um, not you know looking at this euro i think to go chasing it on, on a break of the low would probably be slightly unwise. If we can get retracement potentially later into the afternoon, that might be the, the furthered, a favoured, I should say, choice of trade. It doesn't look too appealing at the moment unless we were to have a bit of uh, a retracement there, I would say. Having a look at oil, it actually was just coming to a, an interesting level. Uh, here you can see, obviously, other than being yesterday's high point we've also got uh, a bit of a trend line uh, that would mark up uh, around that area as well so you see the breakthrough around here yesterday early morning uh, offer good support in previous sessions and along with well the high that we had back on the 28th you can see that would come in around the same area around 59 60 would be a point uh, to keep an eye on certainly this morning and as with all these markets that had perhaps been trending lower can you get those trend lines on and you know when the volume picks up for oil and s p into the back end of the session when it should be you know more of a priority that's when you can start to to look at it uh aussie dollar uh, it, again it's just a case of saying what we've said for uh, all week with it being in the top end of that range uh, holding firm the lower end of the the middle part of that range remember we said it yesterday 69.09 well at, at three o'clock 69.09 was the low of the day so you're you're in these two ranges here bullish above 69.09 and of course if we can get above that top end of the range or bearish uh, certainly shorter term if we can get back below there and you've got some interesting targets down from the low of the 24th and the bottom end of that range as well that you would be keeping an eye on but for now all, all things contained there uh, so you know, not, not much doing the yen unfortunately uh, the idea we talked about all briefing or unfortunately for me I should say uh, that happened uh, late well early I should say this morning the break of that trend failing you know to, to push higher all yesterday around that R1 and finally the trend broke came back to retest and it's now pushing lower uh, as well helped of course by the recovery in stock so that correlation still working well there with the risk on risk off um, so one to, to keep an eye on uh, as Ant mentions obviously we've got relatively quiet morning so perhaps not one to, to get too stuck in uh, into the markets I think obviously things are uh, are heating up into the afternoon with the, the GDP and obviously got some Canadian data there we saw the the reaction in the Canadian dollar yesterday uh, which has recovered all of that move as, as you do often see with a central bank meeting if there's nothing really that's changed too much within 24 hours you, you do get a full reversal and we're pretty much you know, if we have a look at the Canadian dollar here exactly right now where we were before that came out so not much has, has changed uh, there uh, any questions as usual uh, please do let me know gold is coming under pressure uh, as we've seen obviously some dollar strength come into to play here and obviously with equities having recovered a touch uh, well you know gold uh, just coming uh, a bit lower it, as we said yesterday it's been a bit of a tricky market to really predict what's going to where it's going to go I mean it's looking here on the on the 240 you can see just the failing failure to perhaps push on to that 1290 again as has been you know very key and we're now coming back down to the bottom end of this uh, range uh, so to speak but s2 offering a, a bit of support 
uh, for now. Uh, but I hope you all have a, a good trading day. And of course, anyone that wants to send me well wishes after Arsenal's dreadful, dreadful performance last night. Uh, please send them in the post. But I hope you all have a, a great trading day uh, and rest of the week.